right. Good morning and welcome oops, there you go, to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, uh, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the commission's weekly online event. We are a webinar. Um, and we are a webinar that is broadcasted live um, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time. The, um, but if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it is posted to our website for anyone to watch. Um, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where that um, the recordings are. Um, both our live show and the archive sessions are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your um, friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anybody who you think may, may be of interest, have interest in any of our topics, um, let them know. Um, they can sign up for any of our upcoming shows or watch any of our archives. Um, Encompass Live um, started in January 2009. So we have almost like nine years-ish we're going on going to be 10 years of archives out there. So there's a lot of things to look at. Um, do be aware though, um, because it is, uh, we do have everything out there. We are librarians, so we save everything. We archive it all. Um, so there is going to be some sessions out there that are outdated or have you know old information, um, but we're keeping them all out there just in case anyone does want to watch them. So just be aware, everything has got a date on it so you'll know when it's from. Um, something is old. Um, we do a mixture of things here on the show, um, interviews, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, um, introductions to different resources. Basically, the only criteria for the show is that it's something library related, something libraries are doing, something um, we think libraries could be doing, um, the services and resources we have here at the commission that we'd like to share with you, um, or anything out there that um, around the country that anybody's doing. We have um, speakers both from Nebraska and from anywhere across the country we've had, um, as we bring in guest speakers sometimes, but we also have library, Nebraska Library Commission staff come in and do shows for us, and that's what we have this morning. With me today is um, Amanda Sweet, who is a Reader Services Advisor at the Talking Book and Braille Service um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, which is just uh, downstairs and across the hall from where, I, where we are right now. <laughs> you can see it out the windows there. <laughs> and um, she has a session today that's actually um, was she did at our state annual conference in, okay. in October. Uh, Nebraska Library Association and Nebraska School Librarians Association have a joint conference every fall. And she did a session on this and she's kind of tweaked it a little bit for us today. Added a few things. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to you. I'm going to take it away and um, do a presentation and tell us what you got for us about non visual desktop access. Beautiful. <laughs> you can either use the keyboard or the mouse. This should both work. All right. Sounds good to me. All right, so first I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got into screen readers, just to give you a little bit of background about how I became knowledgeable about this subject. And so I started out in a company called Beyond Vision, and it's a company that employs 85% blind and visually impaired people. And for about two years of my life, I was the only sighted person in the room. So everyone in there used screen readers. And eventually I became the coordinator, so I had to help train people on using all the different technology in there and using everything in there. So I had to kind of, if you're going to train blind people in how to use technology, you have to find out how to use that technology. So I took my own little crash course in screen readers and I picked up a lot of information about it, learned how to code websites for it and all that stuff. And then I found out that a lot of the people in Beyond Vision, they stopped using library services because they couldn't access the information. So they went to some of the local libraries over there and they realized that most of it wasn't screen reader compatible. So my main reason behind doing this presentation is to help libraries to raise awareness about this and to get more visually impaired people in the library to get them access to information because I do believe in equal access for all and I'd love to help work towards that. It's interesting because so many libraries do are concerned with being in compliance with the ADA in right. general, but it's interesting that there's obviously some things that they're missing. 
right? And then they're doing some things that are good, but in other areas we're still lacking, right? <laughs> and don't even realize it potentially. Yeah, and a lot of people would love to be completely compliant with screen readers. Some people think they already are, but it's just a hair off, mm -hmm. and it just could use a little bit of tweaking to get the rest of the way there. And that's what I'm here for. <laughs> So this presentation is going to be broken up into three separate sections. Um, the first is going to be kind of like a little overview of how screen readers work and what exactly they are. And then I'll move into just a quick little bit about how to set up a visually impaired computer station. And that's just in case you want to set one up in your own library or if you want to help patrons set it up in their own homes. And the last little section is going to be about helping make your own website more screen reader friendly. And this might help you kind of, it's just a few quick ways to tweak what you've already got so that it's a little more friendly to screen readers. So let's get started here with what a screen reader actually is. So it reads the text that's off of your computer screen, but what it's actually doing is reading the HTML code behind the website. And I'll get into that a little bit more with a few examples a little later on in the presentation. And in order to use a screen reader, you use all keyboard commands to tell the screen reader what you want it to read. So you may be familiar with a lot of this already, like Control S you use as a shortcut to save. And it's sort of similar to that with a screen reader. But the only difference is that you don't necessarily need a monitor or any visual representation to be able to interact with the computer. Like when I was at Beyond Vision, a lot of them forgot to turn their monitor on. So when we had to- need it, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I'd have to go through and do a check every time we had a two around to make sure everyone's monitor was on so that people weren't really confused when they were walking behind. <laughs> yeah. And so if you were to get a screen reader in your library, you could also use a, one of the free screen readers to do your testing to make sure that you are screen reader compliant and you can open up your services to more visually impaired people both in person and at home. And you can also become an access point for vision impaired people to learn more about the resources that are available to them. And there is a different screen reader available for each different operating system. And these are kind of like a, some examples of the common operating systems and the, screen, the best free screen reader for them. Um, some of you may have heard about screen readers like JAWS, which is Job Access. I can't remember what the WS stands for, but that's one of the most popular paid versions. And that costs probably upwards of $2,000, so it's kind of cost prohibitive for yeah. a lot of libraries and a lot of different patrons to use. There may be some libraries in, this, in Nebraska that do have them. We did include that when we did, we had a grant, a BTOP grant, where we provided computers to libraries a few years ago. And oh, as cool. part of that, um, they were able to select an ADA workstation as one of their computer setups. Oh, cool. And I believe JAWS was included um, as part of that deal. We had a grant money for that, of course, so the libraries did pay for it. Um, but that was only a few libraries, not, not everybody. Right. And like you said, when you have grant money, that's where you, yeah. you can do that kind of thing. I did not know that. Thank yeah. you. But so this presentation is going to focus on NVDA, which stands for Non-Visual Desktop Access. And I've used that one because it's the most popular free, the free screen reader. So it's accessible to more people. You can download it from anywhere and anyone can download it for free. Um, when you go to their website, they will ask for a small donation if you if it's something that you can do, great. If it's something that you can't, you're definitely not required to. Their main mission is to make screen readers free and accessible to as many people as possible. And there's also voiceover comes automatically with most iPhones and the that operating system. And Linux I'm not as familiar with, but I included it just because it is popular and there are a lot of libraries and patrons that might use it. And I also love their whale icon. Yes, that yeah. was awesome. <laughs> um, 
All right, so how exactly does it work? I covered a little bit about how the HTML code works and what the screen reader is actually reading. So this is going to be the mechanics of how you get NVDA onto your computer and onto the patron's computer. So it can either be downloaded directly onto the computer or you can make a portable flash drive copy. And if you got really ambitious, you could even distribute flash drive copies from the library, but that's a whole other thing. And it works with most popular applications like um, most web, like web browsers with um, the Microsoft Office suite, um, Open Office, which is an open source version of, open, of um, Microsoft Office. And pretty much most things you run into, it will work with, or there's a plugin that will make it compatible to work with that. And it's available in English and several other languages. So it's getting pretty widespread with that. And let's just move on here. And first, were there any questions about how screen readers work or anything about getting screen readers in your library? If you have any questions, you can type them in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface and we can grab them here. Or if you have your own microphone, which if you do, you can use that to ask your question if you wanted to. Just type in that I have a microphone, please unmute me, and I can do that and you can ask your question that way. But nothing's been typed in while you're talking. All right, so I'll just push on here. Mm -hmm. All right, and now this is an example of what you might see on your computer screen. And it is color-coded. Um, I, I made them very garish-looking colors in some <laughs> cases, but that is for a reason that we will get to later. And this is what the screen reader is actually going to be reading. Um, it kind of looks like just a mess of code, but we'll kind of parse this through a little bit later on when I get into examples of how to make your website more screen reader friendly. And this is just kind of a little brief example. All right, and so I went over a few different reasons that a library would use these materials. But I would also like to go into kind of a an example that I ran into in a public library that I worked in um, back in my undergrad. So there was a patron that came in and said that her son was losing their vision, was losing his vision, and she didn't know what to do. He was completely lost because he thought he was going to be losing computer access. Mm. And luckily at this time, I had already had some experience under my belt at Beyond Vision. And so I wound up letting her know about screen readers and letting her know about some of the resources that were available. And she told me something kind of interesting, which was that he was terrified to go into one of these agencies that specialized in blind, visually impaired patrons, people. And I, asked, I was kind of wondering why that was. And she said that he was terrified that this was actually real. Uh, that, make it real. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was more willing to go into the library because it was a place that he had been many times. It, he was familiar with it. So I wound up actually showing him how to use NVDA and giving him a brief overview in the library. And it was actually years before he could bring himself to go to one of the American Federation for the Blind or something like that mm -hmm. because he hadn't internally accepted it. Mm -hmm. And this kind of making these resources available in the library is just another access point that people might feel safer using and you might even just be able to help them set it up in their own home, even if it's not in the library itself. Mm -hmm. But pretty much anything helps with this. And there's also some resource packets available that I'll go over at the end of the presentation just so you know where to send people. All right, and if you did want to set up your own screen reader in the library, um, this is a little table that'll show kind of how much the cost estimate is. Of course, the screen reader itself is free, 
And some of you may have heard the, the Windows Ease of Access Center. Um, that'll let you kind of change the contrast on your computer so that people with macular degeneration or some of the other different um, vision issues will be able to see the colors better or be able to magnify the images better. And this is something that's already on most computers, uh, most Windows-based computers. And headphones, a lot of libraries already have. Otherwise, patrons might be able to use earbuds or something like that. Yeah. And tactile markings on the keyboard is just a little dot that you stick on certain keys. And I've also marked which keys are best to put it on there. Um, this layout is actually designed for NVDA because insert is the button that is kind of like the most common key combination. So for example, Windows-based control is the combination that we use, like control S, control V, control C. Mm -hmm. And with NVDA, it's insert F7 or insert N or just as an example. And F7, I'll go into why that's more important a little bit later on when we have more examples in front of us. And F and J are the homebrew, the homebrew keys that are just an orientation point. And basically, if you were to close your eyes, run your hand over the keyboard, your pinky would run into these dots and you would know where to kind of put your hands to orient yourself and figure out what you're doing and be able to access the keyboard faster. So it really doesn't really cost too terribly much to set up a visually impaired station. If you already have a headset, all you'd really need is the tactile markings, which would be MCBVI distributes them for a dollar or two if you pick them up in person or if you have a nearby representative. And Amazon also sells them for maybe three to seven dollars, depending on which kind you get, because Amazon has everything. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And the rest of this is pretty much optional. Um, signature line guides, the people at Beyond Vision used them a lot because you need signatures on a great many things, mm -hmm. including a TDBS application. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And you can just put it above the line that they're going to use and place the pen just at the top left hand corner and then they'll write their signature on the inside of the box. Um, that's definitely not necessary, but if you have a lot of visually impaired people or a lot of blind people in the area, that might be a good thing to pick up. And talk, um, talking calculators, they came in handy a lot during tax season. I know a lot of libraries do kind of in-library tax preparation or right. tax help. They have someone come in that will, you know, who's an expert to help them, help right. the patrons, yeah. And talking calculators came in handy a lot just to help out visually impaired people or to, you don't even necessarily have to be, be visually impaired. You can be like the elder that you can use those a lot because it's hard to see the tiny numbers in a calculator mm -hmm. sometimes. But moving right along here. So someone does have a question about the um, having the uh, screen reader on the flash drive. Okay. Um, she says, um, my library is moving toward using Chromebooks in our public areas. Would the screen reader still work by using a flash drive on, on a Chromebook? Um, Chromebook has its own screen reader. Ah, there's a built-in. Yeah. Awesome. So okay. it's built-in. You don't need to add anything to it. And they do have user guides on the website to be able to use it. Even easier. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that does remind me, uh, if you are using the portable copy for a Windows-based or another computer, they do have um, setups for laptops and for regular keyboards. So that might be something to look into if you were to get your own. And the, so that's good to note for schools too that Chromebooks have because a lot of kids are they're doing a lot of one to one right um, devices yeah. and I know sometimes Chromebooks is what they would be buying for right. everyone in the school. Yeah. And the last section of this presentation is generally making websites more screen reader friendly. 
So these, this is just a little listing of kind of what I'm going to touch on. It's not going to be an incredibly in-depth review because we've only got an hour here. <laughs> but in fact, we've only got about a half hour. So we should, we can definitely cover that in that time. We'll be fine. And so first I'm going to touch on the headings. So we're going back to the example here about the headings in, uh, come on, I'm just going to play a little snippet of how a screen reader would read this. You may have noticed on there that it announced every time that there was a heading on there and it would say what kind of heading it was and that's how you would reformat the website and this is where the color coding from that website comes in now mm -hmm. so on the left hand side is what you would see on the computer screen and on the right hand side is what you would see while you're writing the computer, the, while you're writing the website. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice that on the right hand side it'll say H1, H2, H3. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing is just making sure that these are in the right order. So a lot of times what um, website builders will do is it'll choose the heading that is just the size that you want it to be. So it might default, so that H1 might default to H3 because it's the font size that's the right default. Or some website builders will just automatically code it as a paragraph. And a paragraph is that little P in brackets on the right hand side there. And if it is, if it winds up all being paragraphs are all being kind of out of order, it jumbles up how the screen reader interprets it. Because the screen reader will show up a list like this. If you hit insert and F7, it pulls up the heading list. And this is kind of the, how it kind of interprets that. And I made a version of this that'll tell you it corresponds the H1, H2, H3 with the heading that the screen reader user actually mm -hmm. interprets on there. So this is kind of like driving home the point that if your headings are out of order, screen readers will get really jumbled up. They won't be able to access information in the same way. And it might kind of wind up completely out of order and they this is the one of their main navigation points of how they interpret a website. Um, a lot of screen reader users will go to a website. They will first they'll go through the headings list and find out the organization of the website, make sure it has the information that they want on it, and see if it's actually relevant to them. And they'll also pull up a list of the links. So this is a list of all the links that are on that little sample page that I put up there. And this is where the description of the link really comes in handy. Um, you'll see that that click here, that is why you don't want to use that kind of phrasing in there because if a screen reader pulls that up, 
They have no idea what you're talking about. This is one it's of just going to say click here and you don't right. know what you're going to get when you click. Exactly. Here. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why you want to be a little more descriptive when you're putting together your link titles. And it's okay if you don't have um, everything capitalized. You can definitely just make sure that it looks okay on the page. A screen reader won't always say whether something is capitalized or not. So all, they're he all they will hear is ways to stay organized. They won't hear ways, caps, to caps. Then mm -hmm. it'd be way too much for a screen reader user to be able to interpret that way. It would get all mixed up. And so that's why you'll see on this example, the link names just kind of blend into the regular sentence. Mm -hmm. There's, you don't have to do anything special with it. You just have to make it a little more descriptive so that when a screen reader user pulls up this list, it actually makes sense. It means something, you know. Right. And honestly, I think it, as we've moved along in the in years and, and being more comfortable with the internet and how links work, this is actually good, I think, website design is actually having your links just say something, not saying click here, click here, click here, right. or things. Yeah. Um, most websites hopefully are doing that. I mean, I try to avoid the click here thing and make it be, yeah. you know, this is the link, you know, and what it says is where it's going to. People know exactly. something that's a color is something to click on. It's become known. So hopefully, in general, website designers are moving away from that click here and, and making it look more um, professional by having it just be built into the actual words themselves. Yeah. Fingers the crossed. Sentence. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we can try. Yeah. And the other thing that I ran into a lot is, um, so I keep going back to Beyond Vision, and then it's kind of like the main example that's relevant to this, so bear with me here. <laughs> but so back when I was at Beyond Vision, we brought in a, a, it was a new call center technology that we used. But they claimed that it was screen reader compliant, but it, it wasn't actually. <laughs> So when they sent people over to train the call center how to do it, first the trainers didn't know how to use a screen reader, so they didn't know how to exactly train everyone there. So they actually wound up spending the two days of training making the website compliant. So I wound up building like a whole bunch of hot keys and kind of like shortcut keys so that they'd be able to interact with the page at all. Mm. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to do their job. But so that's kind of the point that I'm making here is that for web developers or for anyone building websites, it's kind of nice to start thinking about accessibility in the first place instead of building it and then going back and go back. retro it. Yeah. Yeah. Because then you wind up taking extra time doing it and it's just faster and easier to just do it from the start. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people definitely are starting to think more about that. Um, ADA compliance is definitely getting more popular. Screen readers mm -hmm. are more popular. And awareness is definitely being raised about that, and I love that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just here to help that along a little bit. With, with um, the baby boomer generation getting up to that age where they're becoming elderly and they're going to need right. this more too, that may be a big push as well. You're going to have more of your users coming in who are going to need this. I mean, that definitely. big group of people, as they move through, <laughs> you know, yeah. has to relate to them because there's just so many of them. Right. Um, more, that's going to be it's going to be needed even more. And it is pretty quick and easy to set it up in the library, and it's just kind of nice to get ahead of the game sometimes. And now going back to this main list here, um, we've gone over how to set up the headings and we've done the link names here. So let's move on to adding the alt text for images here. So a lot of times when screen readers try to, of course, visually impaired and blind people can't always see the images on the computer. Sometimes they'll be able to blow it up and make it about five times the normal size to be able to catch little glimpses of it. Mm -hmm. 
but it's easier to have a really good description of what's actually in that image. So I have an example here of two different images. Now the image on top does not have an alt text letting anyone know what it is. And a screen reader will completely ignore that. And yes, they won't even know there's right. a picture there at all. Yeah. And the image on the bottom, it will have an alt text that says button diagram for standard player. So to give you an idea of how this actually comes into play, this is what a screen reader would do to access these. Yes, they don't know what's on the alt text to let us be. We don't know what the image contains. The image, they don't know on the alt text stating the image is a button, not a button for standard player. Um, not a button, not a button for standard player. Um, the image the alert doesn't have an old text stating the image is a button, not a lamp for standard player. Um, not a button, not a lamp for standard player. Right, so you notice that it read this sentence and then it didn't do anything with this. It skipped it. And then it read this, the one on the bottom. Mm -hmm. It said blank, and that's just because I put a it's bracket br slash, which is just a blank line. So it read that, and then it read the the graphic image and button diagram for standard player. And that graphic image is what a screen reader reader uses. They're trained to listen for that, and it's what they watch out for when they're in, interacting with sites. So there's kind of a rule of thumb that I use for coding the images on here. And that's if the image is definitely vital to the understanding of the site, I'll put in an alt text for it. And if an image is not necessary, like if it's a completely decorative little piece of scroll work yeah. in the corner, I'll just leave it alt and then it'll be two little quote marks and it'll be blank in the middle there. And just to give you an idea of what this, so I can tell you alt text a million and one times, but you'll have no idea what that means necessarily. <laughs> so what I'll do here is kind of show you what that would look like on the screen here. So again, the top here is what you would see on the screen and the bottom is the code. And this is the line that we're looking at here. Um, this will be like the file name of what your image is. And then you've got like the size of it. And this is the money shot here. This is what it alt. Is. Yeah. And if you don't have an alt here, a screen reader doesn't acknowledge it at all. And this comes into a play a lot, especially with the diagrams that are up here. Like um, on the website, on our TBDS website, we have a lot of these diagrams letting people know how to use the player, how everything works. And if they have a sighted aid using it, then the image can come in handy. Sure. And if they're kind of working together, they want to be able to interpret that image in sort of the same way. So sometimes images will need more description and sometimes you can get away with just saying picture of a talking book player. Mm -hmm. So it's all about context, but it just kind of helps out the screen reader user to be able to interact with the site the same way that a sighted user would be able to. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed sometimes when I've been doing um, website design or updating things on our website through either um, use Expression Web or uh, WordPress for blog posts and things. When inserting images, there's always a, um, a field that says, you know, uh, the caption for it. Right. Do you want to do a caption for this? And sometimes because of whatever the image I brought in, wherever it came from, it brings it in on its own and yeah. it fills that in. I don't really know why it does sometimes why it doesn't because all my images have names and sometimes it's blank and I have to type in what it actually is to come up. And is that the same thing that would then feed through as being the alt or is that? It's similar. Yeah. yeah. So um, you can put 
the caption option will actually put something under here. It'll okay. physically put something under there. So if you put an alt and a caption, mm. it'll read this twice. Ah, okay. And that's not the end of the world. Um, screen reader users are used to that. I mean, they <laughs> sure. don't really care too much. Yeah. But if you don't want to use a caption, you can put the alt in there. But if you know you're going to have a caption, sometimes for sighted people, a caption is useful for them. Exactly. The actual caption yeah. that's underneath the picture too. Yeah. Yeah. So you might need to have you might need to have both. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. It's interesting. It's cool that this is making people have to know HTML code because I've gotten the feeling lately that because things yeah. are so easy with um, for people creating web pages or doing um, WordPress sites or blog things to that a lot of the knowledge of all the HTML code people are it's a you don't need to know it just you know it's right. all what you see yeah. is what you get type thing and um, it makes it easier for people designing a website yeah. sure that I don't have to learn HTML but I think you really still do. I mean, I still yeah. pop over to my code for every anything I'm doing. But there's always something that's going to mess up, and I have to figure out why I didn't do it. And the only way to figure it out is to figure out I forgot the right. end paragraph yeah. or the whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and I pretty much live in my code. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But and my main thing with this is it's awesome to know code. I love code. Mm -hmm. I heart code. <laughs> but Sometimes you just want to use the builder too. Yeah. So what I'd like to be able to show people is how to interact with their builder and then just pop into the code for about 30 seconds, adjust what you need, mm -hmm. and then go back to the safe zone. Yeah. And there are some web builders that are getting better at adding a field for alt text. Like yeah. um, I was in Dreamweaver the other day, mm -hmm. and they started adding a field for alt. So you load in a picture, you drag it over to where you want it to be, and then on the sidebar there's a little field that says ALT, and then you fill in what you want it to be and it pops that in there. That's awesome. So there are, like some website builders are getting better at it, but they, there's a long way to go, and until, they, until every website builder gets better at it, it's easier to just pop into the code and do it, just fix it there. Yeah. And if you have any questions about it as you go along, you know where I live. <laughs> yeah. And before I continue on, are there any questions about anything we've covered so far here? Sure. Type into your questions section if you want to know anything more about the coding and of these images. And should be able to Oh, wait, do it again. And try it there. That's it. I was close. <laughs> yeah. All right, so now back over to my handy dandy list of what we've covered so far. Uh, we got up through alt text here, and now we're on to labeling form fields. So, say for example, you go into a website and you want to submit a question that'll get emailed over to the company. And you want to put in your name, you might want to check off a few boxes saying what you're, what you're asking about, maybe add a comment. So for a screen reader user to interact with that, if you don't add a label to your edit fields, it'll just say edit, 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 edit. And there'll be no way to interact with the with the form, and the vision impaired user won't be able to use that function of the site. But if you do add a label to the form fields, it'll say name, edit, um, contact information, edit, um, check this box here, edit, and things like that. Well, actually, it won't say edit for check this box here. But you know, let me just show you how it would actually work here. So we'll go, I added just a little sample of a form here. Mm -hmm. um, I added an edit field and then just a couple check boxes. There's a ton of different options for a form, but I didn't want to make this too horribly long, so I just chose a couple things. And this is what it looks like on the site here. And 
So this is where the, I overscrolled, sorry, I'm going back. <laughs> but this is where the, the checkboxes start here. So you can kind of, I like to give people a little cheat sheet to find where they are in the code. If you click in the middle of the code and hit Control F, it'll pop up a little find box. And then type in name, which is what you see on the screen here. Mm -hmm. Enter, and it'll highlight every Very instance clear. of name. And this is the one you want here. And if you want to find the option one, option two, option three, you can also do the same exact search there. And it's just easier to kind of orient yourself as to where you're, what you're seeing on the screen versus what you're seeing in that mess of code down there. And so this is kind of like the important part that I'm getting after here, mm -hmm. which is the label for here. And the label for name is what makes this pop up here. This is also helpful for, helpful for sighted users because people want to know what they're actually filling in there. Mm -hmm. But the label for will also, uh, when it's paired with this input ID and the name here, it's what will read it in the screen reader. So it's kind of both those two working together mm -hmm. that'll help the screen reader actually interact with it. And the same goes for the options down here. You have that same label working together with the actual input field. And let's see. I can also go into you know, if you have any questions about how to make different form fields accessible, there's also a really great resource out there um, that was put together by the American Federation for the Blind. Mm -hmm. And I do have a virtual handout available. So I added it to the website here. And it is... here. So this you can go into to find kind of like a little brief overview of what this presentation was about. Mm -hmm. And this is the what you can go to to find more information about coding for screen readers. Awesome. So this was made by the American Federation for the Blind and they give a lot of different examples. They give some different resources. I'll close this because we don't need it anymore. And this is kind of the World Wide Web Consortium is also a really great, great place to go to. Um, they're kind of like a leading edge in accessibility there. They made this whole huge guidebook as to, to help out developers. Um, for this one, you need to be a little bit tech savvy, but for the ones that are down here, um, if you're using a website builder, these tips and tricks to improve web, web accessibility, they're great for working with web builders and they give great examples like that. Mm -hmm. And it's just a good place to go to for that. And at this point, are there any other questions that you have about accessibility? Any questions? Go ahead and type in whenever you think of anything. If there's something on your websites that you're wondering about, uh, how to fix it, or um, are you doing it right, maybe? Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, type in now and uh, we can get your questions answered. Um, we do go officially on um, Encompass Live, just let you know, goes to officially 10 to 11 a.m. Central Time. Um, but if we do run long, that's fine. This is our show. We'll take whatever it takes to get through everything for you to get through all your slides when you're demoing. And if you guys do have any questions, um, we'll stay until anything, everything is answered and have it all figured out. Um, if you do have to leave at 11 o'clock because that's all you allotted, that's fine. Like we said, at the beginning, we are recording, so you can always go back later and watch the end um, bits if we do run over time. So.
And this last one I can just cover in a quick elevator speech, just a couple sentences long. Um, so when you go to your main website, um, just click in the address bar and start hitting the tab key. And when you hit the tab key, just kind of take a look at where it starts to highlight. And it'll start highlighting the links and it'll start highlighting the form fields. So if that highlights in like a halfway decent order, that makes sense to a sighted person. Odds are pretty good. It'll also make sense to a screen reader. And I won't go into so that's the, like a little test kind of right. that you can run. Yeah. It's just a quick little litmus test. It takes mm -hmm. maybe like half a minute. And I won't go into the whole detail of how to fix it if it is broken, but that American Federation for the Blind site will have a lot of resources to help with that too. And at, with that, I'll just finish up by just giving a little overview of the different resources that you can send people over to. And of course, number one, talking with Braille Services. Hi. That's us. <laughs> And then Hadley Institute for the Blind Visually Impaired, they do training courses through the mail. So if people want to learn Braille, if they want to learn screen readers, if they want to learn computers, technology, a bunch of different things, they can contact Hadley and then they do either email or through regular mail correspondence courses. And they have, um, it's a free service, and blind vision impaired people or relatives of blind vision impaired or organizations assisting blind vision impaired can use Hadley. And Nebraska Commission for Blind Vision Impaired are great for in-person tutorials and in-person training for orientation, for cane orientation, computers, um, I believe they have a woodshop class. Don't quote me on that, though. Um, they used to. I'm pretty sure they still do. And Nebraska Center for Education of Children who are Blind or Visually Impaired. Um, they do similar things to NCBVI, but they work with children who are still of school age. And American Foundation for the Blind they are the ones that put together that resource for coding and making website accessibility and they do a whole lot of other things. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, and my email address is also on that virtual handout that I... Mm -hmm. It's on the first slide of this too. Right. Yeah. yeah. So the PowerPoint's here too. Um, we'll have a link and, and when we do the archive afterwards, we'll have a link to the virtual handout. Um, but also, um, we usually take PowerPoints and we upload them to, we have a SlideShare account where we share presentations. Oh, um, we'll upload that there so you have both of those um, options um, for all the content. Perfect. Well, but that was my spiel, and I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, does anybody have any any questions? Any last minute things you want to know about screen readers? How to get them? Um, you know, obviously, making your website, getting a screen reader is great, or having something that is on the computer. But for many websites that are out there, but making your own website, your library site. Or your OPAC. Or your OPAC compatible with them is going to be important for providing, specifically providing library services to a RAM that comes in. So it's kind of a, it's, it's definitely, it's a two-step uh, right. process here. Having the screen reader software or a, or a workstation that yeah. is the, the ADA one, and then making sure that at least what you're offering is um, at least what you have control over. You don't have control over everything on the internet, so and I'm What's assuming, that yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I obviously just like you're saying, the people using these understand that they're going to encounter right. some sites that are just going to be gibberish, right? Which that even happens for sighted people. <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but at least for your own, um, I think it's great with all these tips about all the coding and everything and what. The green screeners actually do because I personally had no idea. Yeah, I just assumed it saw what was on the screen and just read the same thing that we see, but it's not. Right. It's 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 like it's computer. It's coding. It's looking behind the scenes to yeah. see what's actually what you've got um, built in behind the scenes there. Oh, and making Google and Overdrive accessible too. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Worth looking into. 
of it? Do they have special setups, or is that something we? I mean, how do we? Um, I kind of worked out a way to make people accessible. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> yeah. There's limits what we can do to some right. of another company's yeah. 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 services. Yeah. Oh, and if you give a visually impaired person the web address to Hoopla, um, make sure they have their library card number too. Because mm -hmm. if you just say, oh, enter your library card number, they'll get home, pull up the card, and go, well, I tried. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That needs to be part of the URL that you get yeah. because they yeah. need specifically to get into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But definitely, if you have any questions, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, is this uh, the, so this is the end of all the slides you've shown? Then? Right. So, okay. Yeah. I'm go back to the first one that has your contact info on there because that'll have to put a blast. That was at the very beginning. There you go. There it is. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so Amanda's here at the Library Commission. Um, email, phone number, um, that reach out to her as you're working on your sites. Um, if you do have any, um, need any help, that's what we're here for. But it looks like nothing, that nobody has any desperate questions. I'm typing anything in. I can't see if people are typing. I just, I only, I only see it when it's done. So, um, if you... It's the day before Thanksgiving. It is. I wouldn't have any questions either. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to think about it yet. Got yeah. a long weekend coming up, hopefully, for many people. Um, all right, then I think we will wrap it up for today. So thank you very much. We almost hit our full hour. That's awesome. So, um, yes, thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Amanda, for coming on for this. I know um, this was one of the sessions from conference that I definitely wanted to get out here to all of our libraries. Um, so many people that don't you know, have the um, ability to attend in person. So right. that's yeah. what we're here for. Yes. Yeah. So um, this is great. I learned a lot about it. So um, I have certain parts of the commission site that I am responsible for. I don't know how much you guys do with checking everything that we have some a huge website. <laughs> well I just <laughs> but, recoded the TVBS website. So yeah. it actually is more screen reader friendly. Oh we even always needed some yeah. tweaking. Yeah. yeah. You never know. <laughs> Um, so definitely, um, I'll be taking a look at that. So that will wrap it up for today's show. I'm going to steal the keyboard in here. And it will be, it is being recorded. And it will be on our website, which is, let's get over here, um, the Electricity Commission website. Um, you can search our site for Encompass Live. You can just Google or use your search engine of choice. Don't use Bing, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but um, Encompass Live is, um, and actually, yeah, I'm going to do this differently if I can't. I'm not seeing, getting what I like here. Close this one Much better. All right. Something is wonky. We had a trouble with this cube. Yeah. We have wireless cube. MBDA is running in the background. Um, oh, see, it's coming up slowly. Weirdly, there. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll do it this way. There, that's a better look at our Encompass Live website. Awesome. Okay, so Encompass Live, the recordings will be posted. This is our Encompass Live website. The recordings go here right after our upcoming shows. You click on the archives. This is the last week's show. 
Um, so today's we posted here at the top of the list. The most recent ones go here. Um, it, we will have a link. Last week we just had a recording, but we'll link the recording. I'll have a link to the virtual handout and then a link to the PowerPoint as well. I'll be here for you. Um, for any of you that attended or registered for today, we'll, you'll get an email letting you know when it's ready. Hopefully this afternoon, later this afternoon. I will be here today, the rest of the day, um, getting things finished up before going up on the holiday break. <laughs> um, and we post it out to all of our um, places that we post things. So um, that will be for today's show. I hope you join us next week when our topic is Libraries Rock Summer Reading Program 2018. Okay. Yes, it is time to plan. It's over. It's already it's been time to plan for next year's summer reading program. Um, Libraries Rock is the um, motto, um, theme being music and music in any way you can think of, really. So anything music related. Um, Sally Snyder, our uh, children, uh, coordinator of Children's and Young Adult Library Services here, will do her regular um, listing of titles that will address this focus, um, both for children's all the way up to teens. Um, there is um, children's theme um, titles, ch teen, in this, in this summer reading program, they have children's, teen, and adult, they actually have adult reading program, um, some reading program information as well, but she'll tell you some books for kids and teens related to next year's summer reading programs. We know you've got to get started working on that. Um, also, all of our other topics, are our upcoming shows are listed here as well, um, working on things for next year, for January, so we'll keep an eye on the schedule. We'll have 2018 dates coming up as well. Also, Encompass Live is on Facebook, so if you are a big Facebook user, give us a like over there. We we post notices um, about, um, I'm not logged in right now, so it wants us to do like here's a, a reminder to log into today's show. When our, our, when our recordings are ready, we post them up here. When we have, when we have um, updates about up, upcoming shows, we post them on here. So please do give us a like on Facebook if you um, use it a lot and you keep up to date on what we're doing. Other than that, that wraps it up for this morning's show. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Amanda, for coming across the hall here to yeah. join us today. It was a long trip. It was. Yeah. <laughs> Glad you made it. Make it back safe. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I hope to see you next time at Encompass Live. And um, happy Thanksgiving. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.